the words came very clear. She said, Mommy, there's been a bomb. Pull the t-shirt up and then there's just like a you know perfectly round hole right on the middle of her spine, like right in between her shoulder blades. The Home Secretary has called it a barbaric attack. We saw people who'd got multiple projectiles in their bodies. This is just like I'd experienced in Afghanistan. The Manchester terror attack was a crime that shook Britain. On the night of the 22nd of May, 2017, at a little after 10.30 p.m., pop singer Ariana Grande had just finished her performance at the Manchester Arena in front of 14,200 people. Most of them are young girls, just teenagers and children. These are the stories of those whose lives were changed that night, told in their own words. Originally, we had told her that we couldn't get tickets for the concert. And then we gave her them for Christmas, so she'd waited to May, you know, so five months. And so she was so excited, counting down the days. She had a countdown on her phone, uh, one of these apps that, you know, counts down the days. And then a few days before, it was like she just couldn't speak. She was so excited. We decided to go on the train and we were getting a cab down to the train station. She was so excited. They were both so excited. All day at school, she was just telling all her friends. And then she got home, changed as fast as we've ever seen, ready to leave the house. So we had um, the Ariana Grande CD on in the car. All the way there, she'd made a sign. She was singing her heart out. It was so happy, you know, the atmosphere on the train. There was lots of girls there. We're all looking at each other, all smiling, everybody excited about what they were going to see. We were staying at a hotel for the night and we got to the hotel and she changed her jeans, she changed her shoes, did all her makeup. She said, Mum, I just keep feeling sick. What do I do? What do I do? And I said, you're going to have to try and calm down, you know. We've had the CDs in the car for so long and obviously I think I'm probably a bigger fan than Lily is. So we've been buying merchandise and stuff on the concourse just to keep her entertained. We dropped them off in the foyer and we said we'd meet them back in the foyer. I'd said, Ella, you must give me a call to let me know it's finished so I can come and pick you up in the car. had to wait for a friend. Then when she came along, there was hugs all round, and I took some pictures of them. Me and my husband went off to get a meal while they were watching a concert. I said, I love you, and I'll see you later. Have a great time, and be careful. And off she went with a big wave. The Manchester Arena is the biggest indoor concert venue in Manchester. It's got a capacity of 21,000 people and it plays host to everybody from boy bands to heavy metal bands, massive comedy gigs. And it's pretty much in the city centre and what's quite unusual about it is that it's attached to Victoria Station, one of the mainline stations in Manchester.
So the way that a lot of people access it is through the station, you go up some steps and into the ticket hall, into the main foyer. When Ariana Grande came out and to see her face literally go from sort of like looking to where is she, where is she? And then the lights came on and she saw her and she was like, you know, mouth open. You know, it's a sight you want to see as a parent. She was amazing, one of the best concerts I've been to. You hear her album and then when you hear her on stage, it's like, wow, she's that good. You know, the little girls, and they were up on the chairs dancing. There was one girl especially who I couldn't take my eyes off because she was just doing her own little performance. She wasn't even interested in Ariana, she was just doing her own show um, and dancing away. So I had a last drink downstairs in the railway bar and we noticed lots of other parents there all laughing and smiling and obviously done the same as us. So we made our way up to the foyer. We'd been chatting with the merchandise guys and we'd asked what time did it finish. They said it was going to finish a little bit later and we could still hear Ariana singing. As soon as the encore had finished, we kind of grabbed all our stuff and went straight down the stairs and straight opposite it was the entrance to the foyer. So we went straight out of there um, and headed kind of past the box office. I text Tamla and I said, hurry up out, I'm waiting at the merchandise stand. At this point, I'm driving through Manchester and she makes the call at 10.30 and says, Mummy, we're finished. I'm going to go and look at T-shirts now in the foyer. I said, right, great, I'll pick you up at the shop. Um, see you in a minute. I stood holding the like barrier where the merchandise was and I said to my husband, look, you're gonna, we're, we're going to lose you in the stampede. And he turned to me, literally took two or three steps towards me and then boom. Just like that. You do think that it's such an intense moment that you know your memory might be a bit scattered or scrambled, but I can just remember everything. I remember Lauren saying, Oh, you're walking too fast. Um, and then I just heard this big pop and I could see a flash out the out the side of my eye. Um, and then there was this smell that even today I can still smell. You know, a lot of people were saying that was it a balloon and things like that. At that point, didn't know what it was, but it was quite obvious that it was something more than that. The traffic all of a sudden was very, very built up and there was chaos everywhere. The buses were in the wrong lanes, there was cars beeping. I thought it was the end of the concert, people frantically trying to get home. And then things started to piece together. When I was sat in the hotel, everyone was coming in and they were very, very upset. A lady walked past with blood down her legs. The place began filling up. I said to one of the girls, I said, what's happened? And she said, I think a speaker fell on someone. She said, there was this really loud bang. Then I received a phone call from Ella, who was hysterical. The words came very clear. She said, mommy, there's been a bomb. Adam picked Lily up and said, we need to go. I just went straight to Manchester, straight to where I could help. 
Daniel comes busting the bedroom door down. Dad, Dad, Mum can't find Georgina. On the night of the 22nd of May, 2017, news emerges of an incident at the Manchester Arena. Over 14,000 people, including teenagers and children, had been leaving a pop concert at the city centre venue. As reports from the scene begin to mention an explosion, initial confusion as to what may have happened quickly gives way to the realisation that this could only have been a bomb. The noise was a loud bang, but you didn't almost hear the bang. It was kind of a bang and then straight into a ringing sound. The noise was so loud and then it was so quiet just for so many seconds and then screaming. I was still in the arena with my boyfriend at that point. And I think for me, what stood out was the, um, the, the screams and there was a lot of people who flooded back into the arena. I was holding Lily's hand and I was trying to look around to see what the bang was. I thought it was, might have been something like electrical. So like Lily sort of was on all fours on the floor and, and the sign that she'd, she'd sort of taken to the concert was covered in rubble. I got blown backwards. My husband was nearly blown to the floor. We, we both jumped up and we were just stood there, you know, couldn't believe looking at ourselves that we were and we were like, oh my gosh, just kind of getting our thoughts together. Oh my God, our girls are in there. There were first aiders on the scene almost immediately. There were staff from Victoria Station and ambulances were scrambled from hospitals all around Greater Manchester to deal with what the authorities realised very quickly was a bomb. thought the whole of the arena, everybody's, you know, been killed. That, you know, and I just thought, oh my God, this, the thoughts, it was horrendous, just thinking that your daughter and granddaughter are dead. I just thought, oh my God, no, no. It, you know, and you're alive, you're not even injured. Once we'd come out of the arena, we could smell the and the burning smell. Adam picked Lily up and said to me, we need to go. So I was following him down the stairs. When we were on the stairs, someone stopped in front of Adam and Adam fell over him and fell with Lily and I fell over them. People were charging down the stairs after us. So we just got up as quickly as we could. The deal was that when we went to a concert, when it finished, she'd ring me and then we'd stay on the phone together until I'd walked over and she'd walked out and we met each other outside. Well, there was none of that at all. So I rang Georgina, no reply. Suddenly, this girl is just staggering, covered in blood and burnt, and I just said, oh, my Lord, and I just grabbed hold of her, and I said, I've got to help her, Phil. And he goes, I'm going to go look for the girls, and he ran back to the rest in the foyer, and that's when he looked through all the bodies to see whether or not the girls were there. I had a shrapnel wound in my leg. I just remember feeling like a bit of a warm pain 
um, and putting my hand on my leg and it just being covered in blood. I wasn't aware of Lily's injury because Adam was carrying her. He started saying, she's got a hole in her back, there's a hole in her jacket. She just kept saying, like, Daddy, I don't feel well. Um, so we were just telling her to look at, look at me, like, don't look around. And um, she went unconscious. At that time, I'm taking the little girl, young girl out. She's collapsed in my arms. She was very, very badly hurt. All her hair was burnt and her face, and I just lifted her up because I've, I've got to keep her upright, and we were just sat there. Within seconds of that, that's when the other little girl came out. She was walking backwards, forwards, didn't know what she was doing. And I, I just said to her, there's nobody there for her, so I just said, look, sit down, sit down, because I thought if she doesn't, she's going to fall down. She sat down. With Lily going unconscious, uh, it was a scary moment. But then she came round about 40 seconds later, which was the four, longest 40 seconds of my life. I lifted her jacket up and it was just, it was almost as if someone had, you know, threw gloss paint, red paint over Lily's back. A, a t-shirt was just sodden. Um, so I pulled the t-shirt up and then there was just like a you know, perfectly round hole right in the middle of her spine, like right in between her shoulder blades. We were lucky obviously we were walking away because if she, if she had been facing the other way, that would have been directly in the middle of her chest. We tried to ring our mum and dad's but it just wasn't working because we couldn't hear anything on the phone. The only part you could hear is when they were shouting, saying, can you hear me, or stuff like that. There's so many screams and people around you, they, they wouldn't have been able to hear us either. We didn't really talk to each other, the only time we talked to each other was, come on, come on, let's go, come on, we need to get out. The only time we really let it all out was when we were stood outside the light shop. We just looked at each other and we just burst out crying. And then that's when I saw Ella. She was on the phone um, and she was quite panicked. What stood out to me was just she just had blood all over her. It was quite a lot on one of her legs. Um, and so my um, immediate reaction was just to ask her to sit down. Um, I took the phone off Ella and phoned her mum for her spoke to her mum and reassured her, told her exactly where we were. Receiving the phone calls made me feel really helpless. I'm her mum and I wanted to be there and it made me feel really frightened that something else could happen. I needed to get to her. I've always been able to look after her, I've always been there for her and it, it, it felt horrific not to be there. And that phone call from Jenny didn't take all that away but I can't describe hearing her voice saying, I'm with your daughter. And I tried ringing her. I went to the arena, had a look round, couldn't find her. But maybe I've missed her, so I went back to the hotel. Couldn't find her. I probably did that five or six times. 11 o'clock ish at night, I'm in bed, fast asleep. Daniel, my oldest son, comes busting the bedroom door down. Dad, Dad, Mum can't find Georgina. I said, put the phone down, I'll ring her. And I rang Georgina three or four times and the phone was ringing, but no, was, there was no answer. I was in bed and a friend phoned me up, said, AJ, are you OK? Once I realised what happened, I jumped up, got ready and straight out the door. I just went straight to Manchester, straight to where I could help, basically, and if I could help, I was with a friend and my friend and I were in that road outside the arena and we sort of like ran across the road and into the car park. As we approached the stairs, I, I said to my friend, I said, oh my God, I said, look at the blood all over the wall. I said, it's everywhere, it's all over the floor. And then we went in and it was just carnage. Just total carnage. There was body parts, there was people covered up with posters. I 
just had to abandon the car. I ran to the police officers and they wouldn't let me through. Um, nothing was going to stop me. And the man said to me from the arena, I will run with you. So we ran the full length of the arena and that where I met another policeman who helped me find Ella. I can still remember having first eye contact with Ella on the floor, covered in blood. Seeing my daughter in that state, I just wanted to be with her and I just held her. It seemed like a lifetime, but then I saw Tammy, it was her ringing me. And I just, I just thought, oh my God, and I'm shouting, thank you, Lord, thank you, Lord, that they were okay. So then it's like, right, I look after these two girls. Keeping them alert, that's all I could think was just keep them alert and keep them positive. A gentleman asked me, you know, was I okay? I said, I'm looking for my daughter. So he said, um, the best thing to do is to have a look outside. But I was hesitant to go because I got a feeling that she was in there. Um, the badly injured little girl that I was holding, she said to me, am I going to be okay? In a very soft voice. And I went, of course you are, darling, of course you are. You are, yeah. Then we could hear ambulances in the background. I said, ambulances are coming, paramedics are coming. So when we were on the ambulance, they were struggling to meet everybody's needs. There were doors on the ambulance that were all open and there were people begging for help. Please, have you got a blanket? My wife just needs some water. So that was probably one of the most horrific parts of the evening, actually seeing people just wanting help and screaming and crying. All I can hear is Leslie screaming down the phone. Patients had awful injuries that you knew had been caused intentionally. This is just like I'd experienced in Afghanistan. May the 22nd, 2017. Manchester is under attack. A suicide bomber has detonated a device inside a central concert venue where over 14,000 people, many of whom are teenagers and children, have been gathered. The emergency services swiftly respond on a scale rarely seen in the UK. There was quite a lot of paramedics working on people. As I turned round and looked, there she was on a stretcher, a makeshift stretcher. It was, it was a barrier. And she was lying on it, and they were doing CPR. I had the balloon over her mouth, trying to keep her alive. got a merchandise table, put the legs down, we put her on there with the police and we carried her downstairs. The other little girl, they'd carried her down first to the paramedics that were in the train station. I was talking to her, I was saying, please Georgina, please just try, just try, it's mummy, please just try. Leslie's on the phone and next thing you know, and uh, all I can hear is Leslie screaming to Georgina. Georgina, Georgina, come on, love, come on, love. Georgina, wake up, wake up. The initial hearing that I got of the incident was uh, a WhatsApp from a non-medical friend, and he just said, look what's happening at the arena. So I jumped into the car and, uh, and made my way to the department. I thought, Whenever there was a major incident, it would be panic and lots of people trying to shout over each other, um, but it wasn't like that at all. It was very, very calm. 
The journey on the ambulance never felt speed like it, to be quite honest. Flashes, thoughts went through my head. I, I might lose her, she might lose her legs. I, I don't know what I'm going to do. Um, I can't even describe the thoughts that went through my head that night. I actually really thought I'd lose Ella. Over 250 people suffered physical and psychological injuries that night. 60 ambulances took the injured to eight hospitals in the greater Manchester area. When the first patient arrived, the whole resuscitation room was packed. The surgical firepower that we had uh, on, on, on the night was, was quite uh, remarkable, really. Um, if you'd wanted any surgeon that you could pick, uh, they were all there. I believe we were the first people at the hospital. It was very apparent from probably say after about 20 minutes after us arriving at the hospital that it was just staff were flooding in. They were doing CPR on the ambulance, possibly all the way there. And I was holding their hand, I was rubbing a leg, I was doing anything, anything I could. And they put the balloon over her face again and they were trying to keep her alive. Les was going, you better get here quick. And so we got in my van and we rushed off to the hospital in, uh, in Manchester. Told the little I'm not going to leave until we find your dad. And with the help of the police, they'd got him. And I said to her, Your dad's here now, I'm going. And then we just ran out, obviously, to go find the girls, which everyone had been evacuated out of the arena to the cathedral. So that's where we found the girls. A lot of people didn't have phones, they didn't have money, they were pretty much stranded. So I popped into one of the local shops, I got a pen and paper, bought a free taxi on the back of my car. There's people I was taking to hospital, there were family members which wanted to rejoin loved ones. Even my friends at local takeaways and stuff were like, here's 60 pizzas. I went down to the cash carry and like, bought a load of drinks and stuff. Anything we could do, we did. And because I've got a network of taxis, I was able to get that out quickly and efficiently. It was just amazing how people just opened the doors and like, you know what, we're here to help. I was seeing messages. I live near the city centre. If anyone needs a place to stay, I'm here. It was just amazing how we pulled together, really. You're very professional and you're very focused in situations like this. You, you're trained to operate, you know, on things that come in out of the norm. But I think the difference with this was that patients had awful injuries that you knew had been caused intentionally. It wasn't an accident. This is just like I'd experienced in Afghanistan because we, we don't get many multiple situations in civilian practice, but that was quite common in Afghanistan and, and that the setting up of the whole department and the fact that everybody knows what they're doing and is geared towards that and, and preparing, that, that level of preparation was, was just the same. I think what was really unusual and really striking is when we looked at the images of the CT X-ray, we could see household objects that were lodged inside people's bodies, nuts and bolts and bulldog clips, etc. Which really brought it to home how this had been delivered. There was a lot of blast injuries. 
the blast injury often tears the limbs, so uh, can cause amputations and massive tissue damage. We saw people who had got multiple projectiles in, in their bodies, and you might just think it's a little bit of metal you need to take out, but people with those injuries often need several operations to deal with the wounds themselves. Other people's um, bone fragments have been lodged in inside other people, so you know other victims had had become part of the, the shrapnel, and that was it's a very difficult concept for people um, to understand and very difficult to see. We had a message from the police who were in the hospital to ask us to save any clothing or any items that belonged to any of our patients and also anything that we removed from the patients, any pieces of shrapnel or metal or anything, not to clean them and to save them just as they were because they'd be needed as evidence. It was chaotic, but the care was fantastic, genuinely. Lots of different nurses in and out, lots of different doctors in and out. But they were um, so, so calm. On the evening, it was difficult because part of our responsibility is to inform next of kin and get their nearest and dearest to the patient. And in this situation, that was really challenging because their nearest and dearest were probably also patients. And indeed, we didn't know who they were, where they were, or in, indeed if they died or you know suffered significant injuries. The consultant said to us, she's one of the luckiest children they've ever seen. 22 millimetre bolt passed through. Um, I think it sort of hit her, sort of came from her right side. Because it obviously bruised her lung, they said how it didn't puncture it. They don't know. They said it was, you know, so close to so many things that they said it is a bit of a miracle. They ran with her to the uh, section where there was loads of doctors and nurses waiting and they directed me to a little room. So I sat in there and waited. The nurse came out to me and said, we've got two minutes left, would you like to come and join us and sit with Georgina because we can't carry on for any longer than 25 minutes. So I went in and I stroked her tummy and cuddled her and held her hands and I was just shouting at her, please Georgina. And then the two minutes came and went and they just all stopped. Everything just stopped. By this time I was hysterical and I cuddled her and I held her hands and then I, I, I was all alone with her and I didn't know what to do and then as I went out the the curtains, everything went black and I passed out. We, we arrived and Leslie was fainted on her stretcher. And I'm so like reassuring Leslie at this point, I've not even asked about Georgina. And after a couple of minutes, I looked up to Leslie's friend and I said, uh, how, how's Georgina doing in, in this sort of, and she just, looked down and, and, and shook her head and, and uh, then I realised what had gone on and uh, me and Daniel just uh, just broke down on the floor and uh, we were wailing and uh, and then the nurses came in and asked me did I want to go and see her but I didn't want to see her uh, uh, as she was um, 
and we we came outside and the, the press were waiting for us and uh, and then I drove. I don't even really remember the journey home and uh, I got home and uh, I don't know. I must have got about ten cans of lager and I ended up walking the street for the rest of the night and uh, that was my story. Eighteen-year-old Georgina Callender is the first victim to be named. Another 21 are to follow. The Home Secretary has called it a barbaric attack. Human beings have an enormous capacity to damage each other. Salman Abedi went to school in our city. He hung around on these streets. After our darkest of nights, Manchester is today waking up to the most difficult of dawns. This morning, the government is holding an emergency meeting of its COBRA committee. The Home Secretary has called it a barbaric attack, deliberately targeting the most vulnerable. As dawn breaks on the 23rd of May, 2017, the city of Manchester is reeling from one of the worst terror attacks the UK has seen in over 10 years. It's about six o'clock in the morning. I thought I just need an hour's sleep and then I'm, I can come back in. And my colleague said, you're not working today. You know, uh, I think it was then that the whole enormity of what had happened actually settled on, on me and I just, just realized what was happening. Inside the police cordon, the painful emptiness of the Manchester arena today. The city feels almost deserted and people are very, very subdued. I just went home and I just switched on the TV, I didn't really know what else to do. Seeing pictures of what had happened and starting to hear stories about people, you know, it was just like a big release really. It had been a couple of hours after resting and went in to Ella and said she really needs to have a wash. Um, my cousin helped me wash Ella's hair. It was um, covered in, I've never seen anything like it, black charcoal skin, um, blood. I think the injuries in themselves are distressing, but I think just what was overwhelmed us was why it had happened and we just were managing these patients, but knowing full well that such a terrible thing had happened to them and to our, our community. Manchester's response to the devastating attack extends far wider than that of its hospitals. I think the city came together really quickly. Twitter, I, I remember on the night, was sort of full of, of people offering rooms and sofas for people to sleep on because people were stranded. So there was a huge groundswell of offer of support very quickly. A lot of us who came together looking back on it, it was amazing. From then, the kids who we helped, they're going to remember us for future generations and they will tell their kids, you know what, this happened and, and this guy helped me do this or, you know, I, I got to the tram station in the morning, I couldn't get to work and, and there were taxis there for free. And it was like, you know, I'm, I feel proud. I, 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 I literally got that sorted. In our hour of need, you know, we were in, holed up in a hospital with our daughter and not knowing what to do or where to go. You just want people to know that they were the difference because you feel so small and almost helpless to what's going on around you. Like people were coming with food, with clothes, it's what you need most, but it's the thing you're afraid to ask for because you never want to ask for anything. For people to just do that and know what to do in that situation, you just will never know what it meant to us. You'll never know what it meant to us. On the afternoon of the 23rd of May, Greater Manchester Police announced the identity of the bomber. He is 22-year-old Salman Abedi, who was born and raised in Manchester. Salman Albaidi was born to Libyan parents in Manchester. 
and he spent all of his years, as far as we know, until he was about 16, living in the city. Uh, we know that he had friends and cousins who lived here as well. He was just described as a fairly normal Mancunian lad. I think it would have been much easier to deal with if Salman Abedi was not born and bred and schooled in Manchester. Because then you could just blame sort of sinister foreign forces for doing this. The truth is he went to school in our city, he went to college in Greater Manchester. He hung around on these streets. He's gone in there, you know, brainwashed or, you know, whatever it may be, where he, he had no conscience that there was kids, families, you know, and if, you, if that's what you think is the right thing to do, then you're wrong. I'm not going to waste my time and I'm not going to stress about something that one person's going to do because for that one person doing that, there was how many thousands, millions of people were donate, you know, that restores your faith. And I've, I, I generally haven't thought twice about him. As Manchester and the whole country begins to come to terms with the events of the 22nd of May 2017, those directly affected face their own very different and very personal challenges as they attempt to deal with what happened that night. Scars and wounds, they'll heal, but I can't take those memories away and I feel upset that she's hurt and I'm not hurt and I want to feel that pain. I want to be able to see what she saw, hear what she heard. I don't know what to say to make her feel better. I went to meet them both a few weeks ago. They've both been very positive. One little girl was released after three weeks, but the other one is quite badly injured. It's going to be a long road, for her, a very long road for her. I hope that someone would do that for my child, you know, and I'd do it for anybody's child, any, well, anybody. Human beings have an enormous capacity to, to, to damage each other, uh, but on top of that, then you look at the thousands of people who were involved in uh, the response at the time and afterwards, and you see also the best side of humanity as well. The following day, on the Tuesday, people had started to put floral tributes outside the town hall. And then quickly a vigil was organised. As the crowds gathered in Manchester's main square this evening, they gave their answer to yesterday's single act of hate by drawing together in a vigil of hope. I'll never forget that night. It was one of the most moving personal experiences of my life. You know, as a journalist, you're supposed to keep it together and be dispassionate, but I felt like it was my city. Oh, Manchester! Even two, three weeks later, I was still struck by how many people were still arriving with flowers, with balloons, you know, wanting to, to pay uh, their respects. Pretty much the first two days, I didn't pretty much leave the bedroom. Gradually, you uh, you get to realise what's happening out there and and what people are doing for you. And the the best way I, I, I've described it is is there was a massive big wave of love uh, bashing at our front door, and uh, it just kept coming and coming and coming. She was amazing. She was beautiful, she was happy, she was always smiling. She was always full of conversation, laughter. Always hugging me, she was always giving me a kiss and I'm gonna miss that so much. I really am gonna miss it so much. Georgina, she, 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 was, uh, she was everything. She was a girl that was loving life. Everything was just clicking into place nicely. She, she just passed the test and got, got a little car. She, she was doing fantastic at school and, and, and she'd uh, been accepted into university. And you still don't think she's gone sometimes. Uh, it doesn't last long, but you have little, little seconds where 
you expect to see a car pulling up outside the house or uh, and, but it doesn't last long and you, you realise she has, she has she has gone and she's not coming back The loss and devastation felt by Georgina's family is echoed by the loved ones of all 22 of the victims who were murdered that night. Every single one of us, whether we're from Manchester or not, could relate to those families and those people, and that's who we should remember and how we should try and remember them and their legacies. Amid the sadness, there was also this real determination not to let evil win and a determination to pull together and not be torn apart by this awful tragedy. Life's for living because, you know, just in that click of your finger, your life can change, your life can be ended. You never know what's going to happen in life. You just need to live it the best you can and be nice to people, enjoy life. It is true what they say, you don't know how much you love someone until they're gone. That is so true. And, uh, boy, do I know it, you know, boy, do I know it. There's all sorts of things you look back on, but I'll treasure every moment. I'll treasure every moment with her that I had. <laughs>